All right, everybody, we're going to get started here. Max, you ready? Ready to go. All yeah. right, Never we have to, more ready. to get, off, get off our social channels and we'll, we'll get started. But thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, I'm Ted Blosser, CEO of WarCramp. We also have uh, Max Klimek here from Intercom. And thanks so much for joining, Max. No worries. Wouldn't, cool. be, wouldn't we rather be anywhere else? <laughs> And today we're going to talk about building and scaling a world-class uh, customer success org. Max has actually um, uh, been one of our customers for a while now. So Max, we, we're so glad you could come join us. And before we get started, I'll give you just a little bit of background on WorkRamp and then we'll jump into the actual webinar itself. So for those of you who uh, might not know about WorkRamp or might not use WorkRamp or one of the top training and enablement software providers, we train go-to-market teams like Max's teams. We train L&D teams. We help L&D teams train their employees and also train customers as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach, reach out to us afterwards if you want to learn a little bit more about WorkRamp. But today we're really here to kind of educate the audience here and actually learn from one of the best people I've met in the customer success space. Max and I were able to do a great prep call and I learned so much about him. Uh, but Max, why don't we kick it off? Why don't you just give a quick elevator pitch about yourself and then we'll jump into your uh, career progression here as one of our first topics. Sure, yeah, so I'm the global head of customer success at Intercom. I was the first CSM hired at Intercom three, just over three years ago. And since then we've got a team of close to 10. Um, so yeah, I've started the team from the ground up and now manage the team globally. That's awesome. And maybe give us a little scale of intercom. I know a lot of people have probably seen the intercom chat bubbles. Yep. But I don't think a lot of people know the scale of intercom. Maybe, maybe give us a little background on the company itself. Yeah. So the, the company itself, the reason, the one reason I actually got drawn into is intercom's mission is to make internet business personal. And so we are on a mission to, to make the internet a more personal place, uh, getting rid of the spammy communication that everyone got used, used to in the past. Uh, we are trying to change that. And how we're doing that is, is through a, a tool, a messaging platform. A lot of people know it for live chat, but actually Intercom is omni-channel for the most part. It does email communication as well. Um, and it does in-app and push notification as well. So people that know it for its chat, but it's actually like a full suite of, of messaging uh, within one platform. Um, and Intercom at scale, I think, I think we're close to 30,000 customers, if I'm not correct. Um, so it's pretty pretty large scale. And we've got Customers at both ends of the spectrum there. Intercom, uh, I think back in the day, started at the base camp model uh, where they started from the bottom up, right? They started and build a product for small startups. Their blog was about small startups. Uh, that's actually how I in got first interested in it. And so we have a lot of customers at the bottom end of the market and we're, we're slowly now moving, moving up the market. So we've got, we've got customers at both ends of the spectrum, some very large enterprise customers and a, a shit ton of startups. Cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you're allowed to swear on this webinar. It's totally cool. Okay. Yeah. Shit. I'm going to go for it then. I'm all in. <laughs> Don't have your kids watching from uh, work from home. <laughs> so, and, and as an advertisement to Intercom, we've been using Intercom for almost five years now. And, and you're right. It really transform your, transforms your communications, your business. Yeah. We, we even use things like the help desk uh, capability. So thanks for providing <laughs> awesome service. And I'm, I'm so excited to kind of hear about how you guys have gone from kind of bottoms up approach to your team servicing some of your best customers as well. Absolutely. So before we jump into those uh, topics, so if, if we kind of highlight the agenda items for today, what we'll go through is let's go through your kind of career progression. That's going to be one of the big um, areas we'll go through. We'll also go through um, essentially the tactics you use and the philosophy you use for your team. Next, yep. we'll talk a little about the team operations. And then lastly, one of my favorite topics is around the, the tech stack that you're using. So, yep. but Max, let's, let's kind of kick off at the, top, at the top. Walk us through your career progression from school all the way into landing at Intercom and kind of what you kind of learned along, along the way. Ooh, from school. Uh, okay. Was not great in school. Uh, don't know whether that was my intelligence or just like completely uh, had my attention elsewhere in video games or, or partying or whatever. So I didn't do great in school, but lucky enough, that was actually in my benefit in the end. Um, I, I think I originally had the top of my list of marketing uh, course, but my dad knew I was really into computers, really into computer games. So he actually, my mom and my dad forced me to put down a computer science degree 
as I think the third option. I did terrible in my exam, so I eventually actually got that course, didn't know, not knowing anything about what was happening, and then I ended up uh, loving it. So I did a four-year course in that, um, and then uh, straight after college, um, went to Ibiza, as you do as a teenager straight after college. I came back, I was like, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing, I'm not doing this tech thing anymore. Like, I'm going to start my own company. Yeah. Uh, so I spent a while trying to set up a t-shirt company made 0.00 dollars and uh, never really got off the ground. It was a complete, uh, complete joke. Um, but through that time, I, I think eventually started applying for jobs and I teed up a job when I was leaving college in SAP uh, and through the times they had just, they weren't able to hire me at that stage. So it came to a time when I actually wanted to get a job and luckily enough at Christmas one year, the recruiter actually reached back out to me and said, we've still got, we've got more open positions. Do you want to join? And I was like, absolutely perfect timing. So I ended up spending two and a half years in SAP in an enterprise support te team uh, and that was, that was some of the best times of my life uh, i'd never been to the states before within my first six months i had been sent over to, to la to california uh, spent like three weeks there uh, by myself with my manager fixing a large uh, escalation where an enterprise piece of software had gone down completely for i think it was nbc at the time um, so thrown straight into the deep end, uh, had a ton of great experience there working with really large customers and kind of got that original taste for uh, consultative work, you know, we yeah. weren't transactional, it was very long engagements. Um, and it kind of stuck with me after a while. I was like, I really, I really like this thing where you're actually very, you're stuck to the hip with the customer. You're not there to just try and solve the problem and run away. Uh, so that was like my first taste. When I left SAP, I think I was a team lead for a team of uh, 10 or 11 enterprise support engineers. When I left SAP, I had a plan to either move into product or start my own company. So those are two things I had. Um, spent a bit of time with my friend's startup, doing that, doing product there. Then I went traveling for a while. Uh, and when I got back from traveling, I had like the, the kind of startup was, I want to start my own company. So I spent about nine months doing that. Uh, again, didn't have any majorly great ideas. So none of them really took off, but I, I know definitely at some stage, even now that I do want to start my own company. Uh, so we just kept going and kept plugging away, building websites for people and building our own little solutions. Um, nine, I think we spent nine months at that for uh, nine months, yeah, nine months in 2016. And it came to the end of the year and uh, my girlfriend was obviously kind of stressed out because there was no money, nothing going on. We weren't going on holidays, so we weren't partying. It's like how much uh, you were making when you, when you were selling t-shirts. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Yeah. It, it wasn't great. It wasn't a great situation. Very stressful. I was working for my bedroom. Uh, so it was, it was just a, a tough time. And then ev eventually I, I was kind of like, well, listen, if there's one company that I'm going to leave this for, leave this kind of dream for, it was a terrible dream. It was almost like a nightmare. Um, but if it was, if there was one place I was going to leave for, it was going to be intercom. Like there was, there's literally no other place. And I, I remember applying just for intercom and my girlfriend, now wife was literally freaking out being like, you need to apply for more places. And I was like, no, I'm going to get it. This is the place like I'm putting everything into this. Uh, all, all my eggs are in one basket. Uh, and lucky enough, I got a job. I got hired by a guy called Jeff Gardner, uh, who's been a, an unbelievable mentor to me. But yeah, he, he managed to pick me up. Uh, and ever since then, yeah, three and a half years, it's been an unbelievable ride. That's Couldn't awesome. wish for a better, uh, it's almost like the dream that I expected actually came through with Intercom. So That's yeah, it's been awesome. unbelievable. And we're, and we're going to dive into the majority of that, uh, or, or for the majority of the time, we'll dive into your Intercom experience, obviously. One quick question for you. When you're at SAP, and you're serving enterprise customers and they're obviously like the Oracle of, of Europe, right? Um, and, and pretty, pretty big through the rest of the world. What's the one big lesson you think you learned from SAP before we jump into your intercom experience? The one big lesson, whoo, there was so many, I had so many great leaders there. Uh, my first manager there was, was an absolute legend. Like he couldn't have been a better person. I, I never realized it when I was there, but he, he kind of like, you know, threw me in the deep end knowing that, I was going to try and swim out and he kind of, I think he knew that I was the sort of person that was, although it was really stressful at the time. And sometimes I was like, this is not for me. Uh, I learned so much. Um, probably the, the biggest thing I learned um, was probably just like, there's nothing else that matters other than the customer. Um, in there, the couple of leaders that I had, especially the, the guys in the U S like they were 100% all in on SAP and not just SAP. They were 100% all in on the customer. And, yeah. um, and that was kind of what I took away from that is like, if you help your customers in a way that actually really benefits them, uh, the success will just come from it, right? They'll, yep. They're just happy. You're getting value from your product, whatever. They'll spend yep. more with you. So you don't need to force things. You just really need to understand their business pains, their problems, and actually really try and help them achieve those. 
yep. get, rid, get rid of those pains. Yeah, and that's why you can charge eight figures, 10 million plus yeah, for exactly. software because I mean, <laughs> you, yeah, you better be getting good attention. We were, we, <laughs> at, those, at those times, we were called on site for, you know, when I arrived in Intercom, it was, it was funny because it was lower end of the market still. Although, although they were saying that we were going upper market, I think some of the deals there, people were working on were like a thousand dollars a month, you know? Yeah. Um, but when we were in SAP, I remember a couple of instances where I went on site and you're sitting in front of a CHRO, you know, the director of IT and the director of IT is literally like, I'm going to lose my job. Like, yeah. <laughs> the whole system is down. This company can't operate with this thing. Where when it started Intercom, it was like, people were like, my messages aren't sending. I'm like, okay, like, I mean, we'll fix it. But like, it's, yeah. You know, yep. it's a different experience. Cool, cool. Well, good stuff. Let's let's jump into your time at Intercom. If people have questions, feel free to use the Q&A. That's more moderated by our moderator. If you have kind of uh, chat-related um, collaboration you want to do, just use the chat window. That will message um, uh, all the people on the conversation as well on the webinar. But let's jump into it too. So give us your philosophy. So you actually, actually was doing some research ahead of time and I actually saw this great talk you gave on lessons you've learned. And I think you even did an awesome blog post on the intercom blog, but walk us through your key lessons of building this awesome CS team here at intercom. Um, I love to share that with the audience. Yeah, sure. So the, the lessons I've learned are just my lessons, right? They're lessons we've learned. It's not even just, I don't think they're, just, I hope they're not just mine. Um, but the things that we learned along the way, these are the things that when I look back on in the early days, like the things that actually did make a difference, these are probably the three things. And um, that actually will make a difference if you, if I was to do it again, these would be the three things I'd focus on as well. So the, the number one thing was, is, is gathering together and actually setting out what you're going to do uh, and why you're going to do it first. Um, and I'm basing that on many different factors, not just coming into a company and saying like, I want to do this. This is how I see a CSM team working. And um, that's like, great. Like your, your experience from a previous company is, is really great. But at the end of the day, it's not the same company. They're not the same people. They're not the same customers. It's pro hopefully not the same product. And um, so going in there with, with maybe a hypothesis versus a statement of what you're going to do, and then testing that hypothesis against everything else that's happening in the business. So when I first arrived in Intercom, uh, it was very clear that the, co the company was going to go up market. But as I said before, when I arrived in there, I, it, this wasn't up market to me. Like up market to me was multi-million dollar contracts. If systems were going down, it was mission critical. Um, so I was in two minds at the start about that. Um, and I think after a while, when we really figured out and tested a lot of things like making scaled videos for smaller customers, um, what we really understood is the business needs and the sales team's needs were they actually are going to start moving up market pretty aggressively. And we should fit in beside that and try and, try and help them. So setting that mission was, was, was critical about like what we want this team to actually look like. Um, Obviously, my background was in enterprise support, doing that consultative approach. So that's also something I kind of leaned on in terms of how we wanted to build a team. We didn't want to be a, a transactional team. Um, because a lot of those teams that exist and they do an unbelievable job and they drive huge, huge growth or, or huge CSATs for companies. But when, when we really looked at it and we really saw what are our skills matched to and what do we actually enjoy doing, Personally, I was like, well, if we're going to turn this into a transactional team, I don't know if that's something maybe I would like to do. And how much um, were you, how much were you hammering home this mission? Were you, was this like every one-on-one -on -one you were talking about it, every team meeting? Like how much is it top of mind versus, hey, this is what we do at, at our OKR review once a year? Yeah. So it was interesting because at the very early days, there was just two of us. And so obviously we didn't really need to harp on about it, but we did spend a lot of time thinking about what we were going to do. Uh, and how we wanted the team to look. So whenever we were making decisions, it was always based on like, well, does it match that thing that we had set out to originally do? Like, is this actually going to drive value for customers who are up market? And um, when, when I look back on making, again, videos for, for scale customers, like it, truly answering the question was no, not really. And the pace at Intercom changed anyway as a product. It was a complete waste of time doing that. Um, more recently though, when the team kind of gained size and got bigger, it was obvious that we needed to kind of refactor that mission and vision statement and kind of get everyone bought in on that idea of what is it that they are actually here to do. And um, it's all very well and good, like having a mission statement and a vision for a team that's that's there, but a, a new team that's joining, obviously a lot of people within, within a new team specifically, they want to have input. You hire people at an early stage who want to have input in shaping and forming a team. And so excluding those people from actually making a vision and coming up with a vision themselves 
is not is not a good idea. So more recently, we actually got the whole CSN team to build a mission vision statement themselves and talk about cultural tenants that they actually wanted to follow themselves and got everyone's input on it. How regularly the cadence is, it's probably one of my faults, I would say. Yeah, uh, I think I even told my boss recently, yeah, it's, it's something that I don't do enough, I don't think. Um, and I, I know it works because in Intercom, uh, Owen and Des and all are very mission, mission vision heavy and it works. People are bought in, everyone wants to be there. So something I'd probably do better job at. That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's talk about this embracing. I think so. Uh, Workaround went through uh, Y Combinator back in the day. So we love Paul yeah. Graham. I think this is yeah. his his statement you borrowed. But walk us through doing things that don't scale um, as a as a CS or because I think everybody in CS thinks, oh, if we build this, it has to scale for the next three years. Yeah. But maybe maybe walk us through that approach of what your philosophy is. Yeah, my philosophy is the complete opposite. It's the YC, it's the YC um, philosophy, right? If you're starting a team in a company, it's almost like starting a business, right? If you're, true, if you're truly starting a team, like if you are coming in fresh, there's no one else there doing that. Uh, you can't scale things. You, you, there's, not, there's not enough people to do that. There's not enough resources. You can't just ask sales ops to give you like an account in whatever. So think, thinking about that in another sense as well, is like you actually don't know what you should be doing. Um, again, you can come with all these preconceived notions about this is, I used to be called out a lot of the time for saying, this is what we used to do. I used to do this in SAP. That was like my kind of tagline. Um, like, but that's just the that SAP I, guy. <laughs> yeah, I was the SAP guy. Like I'm going all in, this is SAP. We should do X, Y, and Z. Um, the things that I learned in SAP though, like being with a customer were probably the only things that really worked there, you know, um, in Intercom because everything else is completely different. So all my hypothesis and all my thinking is just like, it's, you can't, you have to throw it at the window almost. Um, but yeah, just getting down to the nitty gritty of it is like doing, doing things that don't scale is, is a good thing. In my opinion, you are figuring out what needs to actually scale. You're figuring out what your customers actually have problems with. You're figuring out what you have problems with as a team. You really deeply understand those problems. You can feel them, you can form them, you can morph them into something that's really understandable. And then you can understand how, okay, how are we actually going to scale this after that? But yeah. if you do that from the start, you don't really understand the problem. Uh, it's kind of the same as the Airbnb guys as well. Stripe, yeah. like the Airbnb guys apparently went to, to Paul Graham or the y, YC group. And when they arrived in, they asked them where all their customers were. And they said, in New York. And they said, well, get the hell out of here and go to New York. Uh, yeah. You know, they just went around door to door meeting all their hosts. Yeah. Same with Stripe. Yeah. There's pictures of those guys like sitting in a room in Buenos Aires where they're manually spent the whole night coding up and uh, implementing Stripe for their customers. Now, it's obviously not the long-term plan, but yep. by doing that, they probably understand all the nuances that they need to solve for when they write their code. So kind of was the there, same thought process for teams. Was there anything specific you can think of? This might be a, hard, a little bit of a harder question of where, you're, where you kind of built something that was almost too much at scale and you were kind of jumping the gun, almost putting the cart before the horse on the CS side where you're like, guys, guys, we actually need to just do the basics first before we think, think of something at scale. Can you think of anything like that? Yeah, I, I would say it, it's, it always goes back to the, the, the videos. Uh, and we, we had this idea of building like an e-learning course uh, yep. with all of these videos. Um, I thought it was a great idea. Like, I mean, the, the guy that I worked with, uh, Clay, like he's, he's moved on, he's in Stripe now. But at the time he was like, dude, this is going to be too much work for us. And I was like, no, this is a great idea. We've got to do this. We've got to build all these videos. And I remember launching the videos and I think literally like the next day, like the next day or like a couple of days after product launched a UI like change, which is yeah. like, yeah, we're changing the UI. Like, <laughs> these things are changing. They're like renamed or Throughout something. Throughout the you know? six months. Yeah. So it's just like all these videos. And like, yeah. I, I think I got a notification today. I've got the whole, my whole 100th subscriber on that channel. Um, but if you look at those videos, like Intercom is a completely different beast. Uh, even in the space of three years. So that was probably the biggest one. That I was like, we need to scale this. I just didn't work. It yeah. didn't work. Cool, yeah. cool. I know we. there's one last topic, building trust by prioritizing people before uh, uh, process. Maybe yeah. give us a couple quick one-liners there on that philosophy because I think it's super important. The, the really quick one-liners for me, it actually came up really recently as well as like the, this concept of being audible ready, um, kind of being able to morph into the situations that are ahead of you. Um, I think salespeople are, are probably the best people on the planet at doing that. They are literally throwing curveballs every single day of the week. Um, but as a CSM team, when, when we kind of thought about like, let's, we're going to partner with sales teams. We're going to try and help them drive growth uh, because 
by doing that, it's going to drive Intercom's mission. When you really think about that, that you can't be a team that is so heavily focused on process because that team has to deal with curveballs every single day. Yep. So if you were to land in an engagement with a, a, a team of salespeople or a customer, and by just throwing a process down on the table at first, it just doesn't work. You can come up with all these ideas and everything, but at the end of the day, that's maybe not what the team needs. That's maybe not what the customer needs. And being adaptable, adaptable to that is, is very important. And the kind of way we figured that out was just by sitting down and talking to, to salespeople, uh, yeah. asking them, what, what do these customers need? What do you need? What, like, what are your biggest pains? What are your biggest problems? Again, you're doing that thing that doesn't scale. Yes. At the end of the day, that's going to become a framework, right? Yeah. Um, so we often, I often just said yes to everything. Uh, can you jump on this call? Like, it might have been like customer, like, I want to solve this m mediocre problem. But at the start, I was like, this is going to get me on calls more. I'm going to start yeah. understanding more problems. I could also turn those calls into what I wanted them to be which is like a full implementation, you know, like you could turn them into what you wanted to by saying yes. Yeah. And back in those days, my calendar was just racked full of calls. Uh, it's obviously not sustainable, but you, you're learning a lot, right? You're learning a, a lot about what the salesperson wants, what the customer needs. Uh, and you're kind of forming that to, to build what actually the team might do day to day. Yeah. And that reminds me, I remember listening to podcast, uh, Reed Hastings on, um, on Reed Hoffman's podcast. And he almost had this exact same philosophy where his first, startup was um, all about process and he basically yeah. said no one could think outside that process mm -hmm. and most people didn't even know Reed Hastings had a, had a startup before Netflix yeah and then when he did Netflix he did the exact opposite he wanted to have people who have had first principle thinking he focused yeah. on being creative focusing on the problems and then solving them yourselves and it sounds just like your philosophy on the CS side yeah exactly and it's it's like that old adage I think Mike Tyson I think it's a quote from Mike Tyson, like everyone, it's something about getting punched in the face. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you can go into a demo, you've prepped it for two hours. You've, you spent the whole day prepping this demo and you go in there and there's like different people on the call. They want different things. Yeah. Like you can't go with the demo that you've got. You've got to be adaptable. Uh, and the process there has to also be adaptable in some way, shape or form. Yep. Especially with Intercom having so many products, different personas, yep. exactly. and probably people are using it in ways you don't even know. Exactly. It yeah. has to be yeah. adaptable. That's yeah. awesome. Well, cool. Let's switch to this next, the next topic, really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of how you operate your team from hiring. We'll talk a little about KPIs as well. Basically, how do you scale the CS org. We had a great audience question from uh, Enzo Santos. So Enzo, thanks for uh, dropping in this question. We'll start on the on the hiring front. So Enzo had a question. Do you have advice for um, people building um, customer success teams from scratch with just a 15 employee company? So I know you didn't start Intercom at that size, yeah. but it felt like that because you were kind of building a team from scratch. Do you have yeah. any advice for people just starting out from a hiring perspective when you're that small and then we'll move into actually your philosophies around hiring. Hiring is, is an interest. I don't even know if we've got hiring locked up here, but it, I actually hiring at any level for a manager, in my opinion, this is my opinion is the single most important thing for a manager to be good at. If you're, if you're not good at anything else, you, you should be insanely good at hiring and you should put a lot of emphasis on it. And, um, but that's even more important in the early days. Uh, and again, this is probably talked about in YC and all these places, and it's talked about by every entrepreneur is your early hires are probably your most important. If you get them wrong, it can destroy the trajectory of your team. Um, and it's the same in this. I, I think in the early days when you, in a 15 person startup, especially, uh, you've got to find people who are generous. You, you can't, if you, if you find someone who's been working in, you know, they've been working in, IBM for 15 years as a CSM uh, and now this is their kind of foray into into a startup and um, you need to question those people and really like drill into them like what are your side projects that you're working on in 15 years in IBM what are the things that you actually worked on outside of that because you need people who are self-starters you yep. don't need people to follow processes just like we talked about before so in the early days like I, I would try and find people um, that are self-starters look LinkedIn I was always a I was always questioning this about uh, doing, you know, uh, charity work and putting it on your LinkedIn uh, as like a bonus. But when I actually really started looking through people's profiles and started self-sourcing uh, contact or LinkedIn um, potential employees, um, 
you actually did start seeing these like trends of people that were like very successful with like high trajectories within companies like LinkedIn, HubSpot or Canva or whatever these companies are. And they had done something on the side. They had, they had something on the side, yeah. whether it be like even education, like they did a master's during work, something that they did by themselves. That for me is like a key indicator that you should be talking to them, at least yeah. talking to them. But if you, again, if you see someone that's come from a place where it's uh, like a long trajectory in one company without anything on the other side, they might be amazing CSMs, but with a 15 person company and a, a small team, you need someone who can be just build their build it themselves. They don't yeah. need to be told what to do. They don't need to follow a process. They need to figure it out, you know? And that's probably the biggest thing for me. Cool. And, in on the hiring front too, I'm actually curious. So like one, one thing I personally swayed way more towards over the last, let's say 12 to 18 months is really anchoring on culture. And I'll also have two or three other kind of key things that I look for depending on the role itself. When mm-hmm. you're thinking about the customer success org, when you're thinking about moving upstream, are there other things besides self starters that you really look for? You're like, these are non-negotiables. For example, if, if, if the culture fits not there, I don't care how good they are. I'm not going to hire them. Like, what would you say if you're building just an awesome CS team and you're trying to move up market a little bit, mm. would you actually want to look for, um, uh, or and what would you maybe filter out for where, where it's kind of unfortunate if you're trying to build, um, enterprise class team here yeah enterprise class team is an interesting one i think experience there with enterprise is, is a good one or at least like a consulting role could be good as well and um, the culture of value things is really important to me and i think it's probably something i, I haven't seen done extremely well in the past um, and something that i kind of really latched onto when I'm, i've been doing interviews again i could be doing it wrong i think we've got a shit hot csm team uh, so I, I personally think maybe we've done it right but i, I don't know um, <laughs> But I think cultural values are, are super important, um, especially in the early days as well, because you want to find people that are bought into the mission and vision and the way that the company operates. Um, now, you want to get diversity in there, right? Like it's not, you do want to find people that are on the, on the, the same path as like a mission that you can like at least rattle it off. Um, I remember we did uh, video interviews. So not video interviews, but video tests. So we got all candidates to go through a video test, a little ride up. But one of the questions was, how would you explain Intercom? Yeah. And you would have, I mean, I went through hundreds of those videos and you would immediately spot people that had done their research, like immediately. Uh, and then you would immediately even better spot the people that were really passionate about Intercom. So you could find people really quickly that were very good at interviewing and maybe read the website, but then you would find people that were like, they were really passionate about Intercom. And I think we've, we've actually found a lot of those people by those videos, is by those videos interviews. And so I really do think culture uh, is a huge part of it. And you should probably lean very heavily on it. The way you test that, the way we did it anyway, was we had the interviews based around cultural tenants. Um, yeah. So you would go in there and someone would have a bunch, a bunch of questions and they would ask you questions about how would you uh, operate in this situation if you had no resources? We're looking yeah. for people who are self-starters, those sort of things. Um, and that for me was, was a big, big moment uh, in hiring. And we started doing those interviews and you could really tell you could tell the difference uh, immediately. You know, it's funny. One of my favorite interview questions is so basic. Um, I'll say, hey, what did you do to prepare for this interview? And how long did you spend? And so people will self-filter out. People are like, oh, I, I, I did 10 minutes. <laughs> like, all right, yeah. you're probably not that yeah. interested. I remember we made a, yeah. a hire recently where she said, I spent all weekend researching. Here's all my notes. And you knew they were passionate about it, right? And so... It's a great, yeah. great way to One of the out. funny ones for me was uh, people that actually set up Intercom. Like, that was a big one for me. They were like, oh, you know, they because they had to do a kind of product demo, almost like a product demo. Uh, they'd walk through how, how you would implement Intercom for a customer. And some people, like a lot of them that we hired, would they went off, they started the free trial, they put in their credit card details, and they implemented Intercom. And you're That's just like, amazing. hey, you like, this is smart. You know, you figured it out. You figured out all the nuances to it. And those are the people that generally were the people in those videos that were super passionate about Intercom. Yeah. And it's very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Let's skip forward. Actually on the same topic of, of kind of people operations within your team, yep. I want to talk about career development a little bit. I know uh, sure. we even have uh, a slide on this, uh, but walk us through and the CS role is really interesting, right? Cause because people want to develop in their careers. They want to get to the next phases. 
maybe you can walk, walk us through your philosophy on career development, how you built it at Intercom. I think this is a super important topic, especially building high caliber team because you're hiring such high potential employees. Yeah, I've got to first admit that this is a, we only recently brought them in uh, performance profiles on our team. Um, which was probably, it was uh, uh, like self, self admitted my fault. Um, I've never been a career path guy. I've never been a performance profile guy. Like I always expect, like if I'm doing a good job, people will know about it and I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep progressing. And at the end of the day, I can change my LinkedIn profile if I want to. <laughs> so I was always like, I oh, kind of sketchy about them. You know, I don't like to be put in a box and that sort of thing, but it, like the feedback from the team. And uh, I think even me now I'm kind of converting into like, oh, these are actually very valuable and really important. Um, so these are only new, but what we what we've done is we we basically just built four levels. Um, I'm I'm expecting this to get bigger over time, um, but we started with four levels and we we base it around uh, three components. Um, first part was metrics. Uh, they're kind of vague at the moment, so I, I will say that before we start talking about metrics later on, they're quite vague at the moment and they're not like quota carrying or anything. They're kind of just benchmarks, right? And um, then there's behaviors, and that is one part that's super important at Intercom. Um, across at least the sales org is, is really, really important. I'm assuming, I'm assuming it will be the same across the, the other teams as well, but behavior is like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you got there. It matters like how you got there as well. So for a sales rep, like it doesn't matter that you hit a million dollars, if you got there and you screwed over your customers and you're an asshole to the rest of your team, like that matters. You, you can't do that. And it was the same for the CSM team. So behaviors is a big part. And um, but the last part, which, which was the, probably the most detailed part is something you're seeing here, which is competencies. So just generally, how are you operating at different levels uh, when it comes to say like product acumen? How well do you know the product at different levels? Um, and we got pretty detailed here. I know some people say that sh they should be very vague uh, career paths. I, I probably disagree uh, heavily. I think they should be detailed. Um, I think they should be a roadmap for people to be able to sit, sit them down on their desk and start highlighting pieces off and saying like, I'm doing this consistently well. I'm not doing this well, I need to get better at that. Um, and I think to be honest, it is basically a roadmap to promotion for a lot of people. That's awesome. And then I'm actually kind of curious, I've heard different schools of thought and you'll see a lot of this on the, let's say BDR, SDR side on the sales side where you had this yep. like natural progression from BDR to corporate AE to AE on the CS side. Yeah. What's your philosophy in terms of time periods, setting those expectations, or do you kind of leave them up in the air? And then also, do you prescribe? I know, again, I, I love listening to Reed Hoffman. He talks about tours of duty, two years in each role, and then move on into another role. What's your kind of philosophy mm -hmm. around promotion time length, and then also uh, moving into new roles in the future um, uh, as a possibility? Yeah. Uh, so I'll start with the first one, like, dur like kind of durations uh, of splits. Um, I I'm, I'm a bit torn on this one. I don't know if it's the right thing to say, but I, I mean, I, I always lean towards performance uh, versus experience. Um, kind of going back to that concept of like someone being in IBM for 15 years, like that doesn't make them a good employee at the company that they're going to join. It, it means they've got a lot of experience, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything when they land in that company. They could still be terrible at their job. And yeah. um, so I, I always take like years of experience with a grain of salt. Um, I've seen people with, with literally no experience absolutely smoking everyone else. Um, like a, a lot of relevant examples of that, even in Intercom, you know, people who never had like previous, very deep previous experience in a role they're doing, and they're some of the top performing people at Intercom. Um, so I always take experience or time in job or in role uh, with like a pinch of salt. The amount of time that someone has to spend in a role um, guided by HR in our company is, is generally about a year, uh, six, six months to a year uh, is the performance like promotion cycle. Um, I've seen it different at different companies as well, but yeah, that's kind of what we would go by at Intercom. But again, okay. I, I always take, it's not visceral, right? The experience is not visceral. It's not like you can't just say someone's been doing this for 20 years, so they're great at their job. They could still be terrible at their job. So you need to like really, I, I lean towards more performance. Cool. And on that yeah. performance side, one of the big, one of the big topics we talked about in the pre-call was this philosophy you, you prescribed to from Andy Grove, uh, ex CEO uh, or late, yeah. late CEO of uh, Intel. Um, you talked a lot yeah. about his training philosophy. 
Um, and, and I see, obviously we're, we're a training software company and I see people debate yeah. how much they should train, how little should they train, when should they train, especially on the CS side, because you need to know the products really well and know the customer use cases really well. Walk us through your philosophy on training just in general before we close off this topic on, on kind of team operations. Yeah, I'm a big, big fan of training. Um, I think like, I think the, the stats that Andy Grove, I remember reading this in high up, no, I actually read it first. Like a lot of people read it first in the hard thing about hard things by Ben Horowitz. Uh, I found the high output management book from that. And I know a lot of people that went the same way. Um, and in Andy Grove's book, high output management, he talks about being one of the biggest levers that a company or a manager could pull to improve the productivity or improve the output of their team, high output management. Uh, improve the output of their team is training and he has some stats some, some crazy stats in there and it's imagine if you have 10 employees you invest 12 hours of training into those employees over the sport space of the next year you should this is what's in the book you should estimate that you'll get 200 extra hours out of those employees by investing 12 hours so i don't know where he did the math to be honest uh, but this has probably been like documented as one of the Bibles of management books. So I trust them. Um, but for me, it's, it's huge, right? It's, it's, it's like when you're doing your job, it's like, it's like cleaning, right? You clean the floor, but the dust is still going to gather on the floor. You have to clean it again. You can't just keep going about what you're doing and expecting things behind you to just stay polished. Um, so, so, so training is really important to me and coaching is, is really important to me. Um, yeah, I don't know if I rambled there. No, no, that's actually, that's actually spawned on. I love that analogy. Actually, maybe, maybe uh, we'll, we'll use that as a team internally. It's such a good analogy. And, and, and that book is awesome. I know uh, it was funny my, when my wife and I, we were heading to bed, she would be reading people or going through Instagram and I, I would have my paper copy of uh, <laughs> management. She's like, what, what's that boring book you're Same. reading there? Uh, but the philosophy. Yeah, yeah. The, the post as well. Yeah, or they're, they're huge. And, and especially for CSRs, because you need to be, as you, as you said, you're moving up market. You, you have to have these new hires on your team, be able to hang with clients paying you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. And they need to yeah. be the knowledge expert yeah. and you're essentially almost a, a consultant to them. Right. Just like in your SAP days. Mm -hmm. So that's absolutely. Huge. I think if you train those, yeah, if you train those core skills, it's, um, you, you can put anyone in any situation in my belief, you can give them any product in the world. You can bring them, you could bring them into a completely different industry, but if you train them on those core skills of like being a consultant and um, even sales skills, like those sales skills that should be like transferable across every role in the world, like negotiation, contracting, everything. If you train those people, train your team on those core skills, like you're basically benefiting them in my opinion for the rest of their career, because they can take those wherever they go. They can take those into management. They can take those into anything. Um, Cool. And before we head into this last topic, since we're on the topic of books, are there any, there's a question from the audience. I um, mean, I saw you list a few books on, um, on your blog post recently. What are the top books besides Andy Grove's uh, high output management you might recommend for CS teams? I know a lot of them are trying to get their teams to do book clubs or kind of educate themselves offline, not to put you on the spot, but, or we can come back to this uh, later on. No, I think I've got one. I've got one. Uh, this is actually a book that it was recommended to me by one of the best sales people, probably the best salesperson I've ever met um, and still work with to this day. It's a book called Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. For CSMs, this is like, it's a CSM team that's going to be consulting with customers. That is for me, like, it's just a consultative guide. Uh, it's a sales book. It's like for sale. It's for salespeople, but it is literally, I mean, it's a Bible in my opinion for CSMs. Mm. Um, it, it talks you through everything about consulting with a customer and the kind of whole methodology there is you are trying to figure out if they have a problem. If they have a problem that your software can solve, then you'll bring them down the journey of a sales process. But until that moment, like you need to find out what their problem is. And if your software product doesn't solve that problem, don't try and sell them, move on. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing for a CSM. You need to get to that pain as quickly as possible and figure out what you're trying to solve. Yep. I think you're right. And it, it, what I'm kind of hearing from your philosophy is I think from a CSM perspective, all the kind of tactical stuff is almost support related. You know, the product, you get trained well on it. It sounds like you focus a lot of the yep. time on 
hey, how do I make almost like an account management mindset, um, or even slightly sales mindset is how do you solve customer problems yeah. in addition to that? Would you say that's accurate? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I tell you right now, I'm sure many other people can do this. So it's not just me. I could train any single person in this world how to use Intercom, but I could not train any single person in this world how to be a consultative salesperson or a consultant like consultative CSM. It's really difficult. They're two opposite sides of the spectrum. Uh, I could teach my mom how to use Intercom. You, you know, you could teach them how to do it, to use it, but to really apply those like consultative skills with customers is a completely different ballgame. First over email, then over VC. And then when you start getting to the ball games of going on site, it is just like a completely different world that you have to operate in with those guiding principles or those core skills. You can't just rely on product knowledge. It doesn't work. Yeah. And on that same topic, um, how much, how much do you get your CS team involved with kind of the broader sales team too? We're seeing a growing trend with a lot of customers starting to put everything under the revenue org. Cause there's a lot of skill yeah. sharing amongst the teams right so how like like in terms of where the team sits hierarchically all the way down to are you training with the sales reps or is it still on your own like what's what's the philosophy you have there so do you mean by cs do you mean customer support or customer success uh sorry customer uh, success my apologies customer success okay yes. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i always get confused i always get confused yeah. um so like in intercom right now the CS, like the customer success team is part of the sales work like we are 100% in the sales org and we intend to be there for the foreseeable future. Like I don't, I wouldn't personally wouldn't want to bring that team anywhere else. I love the sales motion. I love sales people. And um, I love helping them. I love helping customers. And I figure if we, we break that off into a different department altogether, like it's just going to create, start, whether you like it or not, it's going to start creating different barriers. Uh, it's going to start creating processes that people have to follow that they don't really want to follow. And, um, so at the moment, the CSM team is in the sales org. It originally started in the support org. And the reason it started there was that in the early days of Intercom, I don't think sales was like a talked about thing. Not, it's not that it wasn't talked about. It was talked about that we don't really need a sales team. We've built such a great product that everyone will come and buy it. But that is very true at the lower end of the market where you're selling at a self-serve rate. And Intercom was built as a self-serve product. But as you start going up, you need to add humans into the mix someone is not going to pay you a million dollars if they haven't talked to a human. It's physically not going to happen. Um, so when we first started, that's where, that's where the CSM team was born out of. Actually, the original name of our team was the, we were called onboarding education specialists. Yep. Because when salespeople were closing those deals, customers were saying like, how do we onboard? Like, how do we set this thing up? And they had no one to help them. So they were just going to customer support people and asking them for help. Um, and then the support people were like, this is taking a lot of time. Like we need someone else to do this like full time. Um, so lo and behold, it, it turned into a team. And um, there's another team with us as well. Actually, the CSM is sales engineers. Got uh, it. Like without them as well, we would be absolutely nothing. Um, they're like the technical side. We're like kind of product side. And those two combined have, have been like a real force of nature. We had a great question from the audience, actually. So some teams don't have the benefit of having... Um, uh, that decision made for them where CS is closely tied with customer success is closely tied with sales. Like you guys, what would you suggest yeah. for companies where they are separate sales kind of runs on its own CS and support kind of on their own. Are there ways and from the, from the audience that they want to ask is, are there ways you can take a team like that and actually get them more closely aligned if it's not on paper, for example, any suggestions there? Um, I suppose the, the question would be like, if you're working with customers that are sales owned, like who, who is, who is driving that communication? Um, I don't know if someone can answer that on the chat, but like it, who is driving that communication? And if, if the salesperson is driving that communication, maybe over phone or whatever, well, what is your team doing? Are you on calls with customers? Like, or are you doing like transactional tickets, uh, scaled outreach and that sort of thing, which again, is like, it just sounds like it would be a completely siloed motion to a sales team. So if you want to get closer to a sales team, you've got to get closer to them, like physically, like you <laughs> literally have to get closer to them, sit beside them, get on their calls. Like you need to be close to them and you need to bond with them. If you're in the office, start making friends with them. Um, I mean, they're, they're other human beings as well. They've maybe got different uh, perspectives of you, but like, 
you can help them, they can help you. You know, you can probably take a load off their back and you could probably, they could probably take a load off your back uh, with customers. So I think just like, obviously we're not in office right now, so it's very difficult, but like reach out to them on Slack, ask them if they need help, uh, ask them how their quarter's going. Um, they'll probably start hearing you and start kind of vibing off you and saying like, oh, these people actually want to help us out. Um, cool. Hard, hard to answer if you don't really know the ins and outs, yeah. Yeah, actually, we, we took a play uh, from, from that playbook. We actually recently, and it's been awesome, is we've created Slack channels for customers, and we would put in nice. the CS, CSM, a support person if it's technical, onboarding specialist, sales rep, and it's crazy the, the communication is fostered, and it's actually organically spread. It was, uh, one of the AEs just did it randomly, and now it's just a best practice, like within yeah. two weeks. And so yeah. it's a great way to help maybe help answer that question a little bit. It's a great way to kind of foster this organic communication. And I think Troops, that, that company, Troops, even built this into their product recently, but it's such a cool idea. I don't know if you do that at, at Intercom. We use troops, yeah. We uh, with the Slack channels for customers. I've seen a few people do it. I'll, I'd say if if one of my CSMs is listening, I had a conversation with him the other day. But I don't, I'm not a big fan of it in some cases, um, because I've seen things go the opposite way, where it just like becomes this uh, like barrage of messages, being like, "This is broken. This is broken. This is broken. This is broken." <laughs> You're like, yeah, that's why you use Intercom, like chat to support. They'll solve your problems, you know. And um, so I think done in the right way, like managing expectations, I think it can be absolutely wonderful and delightful. Yeah. yeah. Um, You're right. You don't want to have, you don't want to make it a support channel. I think that's the, that's a downside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. So yeah. we, we have about five, 10 minutes left. I want to get into a really cool topic. Our last topic, this is kind of the topic I love geeking out about is, is the tech stack is actually really important. If you think about this pandemic time, um, every dollar you spend, mm. regardless of who you are, is probably being scrutinized more. And so I know you probably built your tech stack pre COVID, 19 and then we're kind of having heading into this kind of tight and spend uh, time period but maybe walk us through your tech stack how it came to be you don't have to give specifics for anything proprietary but even if you want to talk about categories you want to think through that'd be great for the audience to learn a little bit more about how you've thought about building it and the in the mindset you've had about building the the tech stack yeah so i'll start with the mindset of building a tech stack um like my experience, uh, this is again, my experience is a lot of people will run to see a nice shiny product and they will be like, we need this product to, to help us. And you're like, well, why do we need this product? Like, what is it going to do for us? And so when we went through building it, like what we actually wanted to use, it was very much like scrutinized because we're a small team. And uh, we, to be honest, we weren't really thought about in the early days. Even, even now we're, it's the sales team is the team, whatever they pretty much whatever they get, they, they, whatever they need, they'll get right. And resources are loaded on that team. So you have to operate in a, in a kind of lean way. So just saying like, we need this tool to solve this problem because you really like it, like isn't an option really, because you're gonna have to make a business case and it's gonna have to take resources away from everything else. And so we operate pretty lean, I would say, but in the sales work itself, we have a really great uh, sales ops director there who I remember arrived, I think the first pre presentation I saw from him uh, Jeff was something that I was just like, thank God, like this, he's brought in a vision that I've always seen for a CRM. Um, and it was basically like Salesforce is the center of everything. You know, you, if you use this in the right way, if we set it up in the right way, like it will be a business driver. It, like having a business systems uh, ecosystem all connected together is actually a business driver. It saves everyone time. It gives people intelligence that they need. Um, and it effectively lets you manage customers. So at the center of our kind of tooling right now is basically Salesforce. That's where all of our customer data lives. This is where all of our kind of reports and dashboards live. And we don't have a huge amount of them, not heavy on the dashboards and reports at the moment, but that is the center of, of everything for us. And um, we have tools that now hook off of that. Uh, like the team are a big fan of a tool called Dooley. Uh, basically lets you take notes and track activities without being in the Salesforce interface. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the Salesforce interface, but like I can manage it. And um, but not, if you're, you're in not there alone, every you're day, not alone there. <laughs> yeah, uh, but if you're in there every day, I mean, um, it can get pretty tiresome. So this this tool is basically just like a note tracker for Salesforce, but it lets you do a lot of a lot of really neat things. And um, it, it would almost let you manage your entire pipeline in there, which is great. That was one of the first tools we really adopted. The other tools, I'll tell you, like we've got 
I mean, heavy users of like Google Docs, Google Sheets, like they are so powerful. I, I don't think people give them enough <clears throat> enough props for how good their their tools are. And um, on top of that, we have Guru. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Guru. Yeah. Kind of like knowledge center. Great product. Yeah. Um, great product. I've I've never been a huge fan of like knowledge centers. I've always been like yep. one of those people that just asks. Yep. But after a while, when I did that, start people were like you need to go to Guru and stop asking us. It's There's- all there. There's actually a question from the audience on yep. kind of knowledge management and collateral, kind of in collateral in general. Yep. Um, what is what is the philosophy around keeping that collateral up to date, both for for your team internally? I'm not sure if you, you guys kind of have your own subset, yep. but then also um, this might not fall in your realm, but also making sure like the help desk, like you guys obviously have your own product around the help desk, but making sure that collateral is up to date. So you guys are all kind of going off the same corpus of information. Yeah, so I think that's probably more, um, would be would be more in the realm of the customer support team. Like they heavily rely on Guru and the stuff that's in Intercom. Uh, and there's a specifically, like there's a dedicated, like a shit hot team that are like, I think our Guru rating is like, I mean, I remember hearing like 100%, like it is <laughs> trusted, whatever the score is, like it's 100%. Like they've done such an unbelievable job in there. And so they're probably, I'll be honest, like they're probably the people that drive that at Intercom. They're probably the team that is really like, they're on top of that. They know what's going on and they know when someone needs to re- recheck a, you know, Guru card and make sure it's up to date. And um, you also have some managers or directors that will, will ask you from time to time if, if the data is up to date. Um, so and yeah. I loved, I remember in our pre-call when you were, I loved how the way you were using WorkRamp for any of the customers on, on this yep. call is I loved how you kept that up to date as well as part of your onboarding process. Also, I know you can embed guru cards within WorkRamp, which I think you do, but I love how you actually keep it, keep everything as up to date as possible too, which is I think killer for your team. Absolutely, yeah. The last kind of one I had written down here was WorkRamp, so I was gonna leave the the best to last. (laughs) Oh, thank Um, you. So so we are big users of WorkRamp. Uh, I will say like, I'm always a big believer in like content is king. Uh, without the content first, you will not get people to your like water hill. Without the water, they're not going to come. So you need to have good content first. And the way we kind of devised that was we built a pretty lightweight onboarding uh, process at the start. I, I don't know. I don't know if it was me or someone else that built it. It was it was pretty hacked together. Like wasn't great, which we we all knew. It was like very quick. We need to get this done. We've got some new hires coming in pretty quickly. And like lo and behold, the people that came in and were going through work around were like, this is terrible. There's like repeatable content in there. But what we did do. Um, which I originally planned to do as well was every new hire that comes through our team is then responsible for updating WorkRamp. So every new person that came through or every new batch that came through was their job to update WorkRamp. Now, I don't know if it's happened recently because we, we don't know if we're going to hire very soon. So yeah. I don't know if it was like a huge priority at that time, but it's de- I think it's on its like sixth or eighth phase, wow. sixth, seven or eighth phase of being updated. And again, when people come in, they've got maybe nuanced piece of feedback but compared to the first version where everyone's like, this is garbage. Like I'm going to leave in Japan. This is terrible. The onboarding was so bad. Yeah. Um, it's, it's come like leaps and brands. And I think like, to be honest, if you have a team managing that externally, um, it actually probably creates more work for a lot of people because they have to then go interview all these new hires. Yeah. They have to go and then build the content then get them to review it again. Then get, it's just, it doesn't really make sense to me why you would do that uh, for the most part. And one thing that's also really beneficial is like new people want to get involved, right? You're, hard, you're starting a new team. So new people want to get involved in building teams. That's why you hire them as a new person on a small team. So giving them a responsibility like that is something that people actually want to do. It's yeah. not like you're giving to them and they're like, this is bullshit. I was supposed to be working on customers every day. You're hiring people that actually want to get involved and actually build things and take that experience with them to, to other companies. And, so. and I love that philosophy is back to your Andy Grove philosophy too, right? If you train them right in the beginning, you're going to extrapolate that value for the yep. multiple years they're on your team. And so it's, it's right. It's uh, perfect to get that right. Um, during the onboarding phase, which is hundred percent, especially with have, the role, okay. especially with the role with like a product, fo- a very product focused role. Like you, that yep. product knowledge has got to be on point. Yeah. Um, yep. the very, in the first 30 days. And cool. lo and behold, what we have in the first 30 days is someone has to go off and implement Intercom by themselves. So again, a lot of people that we hired were like, well, I've already done this. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it, again, it was like people that were really kind of stand out would have actually done that by themselves and then come through, maybe done it again with a bit more uh, of the premium features and stuff that they would have got for free from, from joining Intercom. 
That's cool. Well, I yeah. wanted to kind of leave you with one question, which is we have a lot of people either running CS teams or on CS teams right now. Yeah. And one piece of advice you would give the audience just almost through your career. And it could be, it could be either philosophical, tactical, but I'm kind of curious, let's say you had a new hire and like, Hey, how do you be successful in a CS role? Yeah. What would you say that that piece of advice is? And not to push you too much on the spot. <laughs> That's on the spot. That is 100% on the spot. I mean, uh, you couldn't prep me for this one. Let me, I suppose there's probably two things. Like one is like when you're working with customers um, in any role, like if you're working with customers, you're customer facing, like make the customer and their problems your number one priority. Like, that is the single most important thing that you could be working on. If you work on anything else, it's because you found out and gained knowledge of something that you need to do based on their problems. And um, so, so in the start, if you're building a team, get on calls with customers. If, yeah. if you're not in a company where they do calls, fair enough, like get on chats with customers or get on emails. But if you're in a, in a role where it's, you know, B2B, pretty large ticket items where you are expected to get on calls, get on as much calls as possible and don't try and force anything. Just try and understand your customers and understand the problems that they have. Because at the end of the day, without customers, like WorkRamp, Intercom, like all these businesses would just not exist without their customers. So that's the number one most important thing at all times. Um, the other thing, if you're just like generally starting out um, with a new role or like a, a new team, um, is it probably goes back to that kind of philosophy at the start is like, don't, don't try and scale everything. Like it sounds like a really terrible idea to say yes to everything and just like to do everything. And, um, but it's what you need to do at the start. Yeah. So just like a lot of people get really ratchety about this as well. When you tell them they're like, there's no way I wouldn't have enough time. It's like, well, okay. But like, just try and push yourself to the limit. If you're at 100% capacity every day when you're starting your job, you'll learn more about that job than you'll ever learn in years of like throwing out processes and trying to scale everything. So just do things that don't scale to I start at the start. I love that. That's like, I was reading Mark Benioff's recent book and he talks so much about um, a beginner's mindset. Right. And so, and he approaches Salesforce as just having a beginner's mindset of solving customer problems. Yeah. And I love that on the CS team is get someone in hungry who just wants to kind of learn and absorb. Yeah. And yeah, you might be at 110, 120% for a little bit, but it's going to pay off uh, once you get into your role. So absolutely. absolutely, Max, this has been a pleasure. We're at the top of the hour. I only, I only thought we were going to talk for 30, 40 minutes, but this I know. is so it's interesting. Like Joe Rogan, I'm telling you, the time just flies by. <laughs> so we could have gone for three hours, but I'm sure, I don't yeah. know how many people would stay on for that. Uh, but I appreciate the time. Everyone check out Intercom if you're not a customer already. Awesome product. Um, and uh, Max, thanks so much. Feel free to connect with Max on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. And uh, he'd be happy to get in touch with you guys for more advice. So Absolutely. Thanks, thanks a million, Ted. Yeah. Great work ramp. Check out work ramp as well. It's a, it's a shit off product, <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm not joking. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you later for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Take Thank it you. easy. See you later. Thanks, everybody. Bye.